our next speaker is Glenn Milner. Uh, uh, Glenn Milner is a senior manager leading climate resilience with Jones Lang LaSalle, JLL, a global real estate services company that specializes in commercial property and investment management. As an environmental engineer specializing in climate risk, his experience is multidisciplinary and extends across many sectors, including commercial and industrial real estate, energy, water resources, transportation, supply chain management, and policy development. Glenn has worked on climate risk, resilience, and sustainability initiatives across Canada, the United States, and more recently has focused on assessing and reducing risk within investor organizations and across uh, global real estate portfolios. So thanks very much, Glenn, for joining us, and I'll, uh, I'll pass my cue. Great. Thanks, Dan. Quick audio check that you can hear me all right. I'm assuming, uh, assuming so. Yeah, we're good. Perfect. All right. Well, thanks very much for having me, and I appreciate the introduction. Um, I'm really kind of pleased to be here today to share a, a bit of a different perspective on um, on, on how the PIVC high-level screening guide can apply to infrastructure systems and specifically um, real estate portfolios held uh, in various regions across the world and uh, its applicability in different contexts. So I'll, uh, I'll just start, if you go to the, the next slide there, Claire, with a brief overview of where I'm coming from. I won't go through all this, but uh, JLL or Jones Lang LaSalle is a global company. Uh, we have presence in 80 countries uh, and a staff of 100,000 people across the world. So uh, part of my, uh, my excitement in thinking about the PIVC process and the high-level screening guide is how it can relate and scale up to some of the size and extent of these corporations working on real estate, uh, as well as managing infrastructure at all sorts of scales in different regions. Um, we, um, we're very kind of conscious about how sustainability and how specifically how resilience factors in at all stages of the real estate cycle, which I'll, uh, I'll speak about in a little bit. Uh, next slide. So I did wanna start just by defining what, a, what one archetype type of portfolio could look like across a, across a discussion with um, partners and with clients from my perspective at JLL. Um, when we speak about a real estate portfolio, this can look very different. Uh, this could be, for example, someone who owns, operates or manages infrastructure within one region or one city. It could be someone who owns or has access and manages, let's say, a handful of assets across two different regions, or it could look like this, where they own and operate um, infrastructure across various regions of the world. Uh, and I've given you just a sense of the types of asset classes that are often in these conversations to figure out how will we you know, assess the risk and prioritize, how does this feed into decarbonization efforts and sustainability initiatives more generally, uh, and typically we are talking about offices, retail spaces, multifamily and single family residential facilities and buildings, um, industrial and logistics, hotels and other mixed use type of assets. So I'll just pause there and let you kind of reflect on how important that can be in the context of achieving resiliency, particularly in terms of making sure the outputs of a risk assessment feed into what they need to to actually inspire action. Uh, and that's a big part of what I'm advocating for in this role at JLL is taking things beyond simply um, being aware of risk to understanding what you can actually do about it. Uh, and just to give you a couple of um, uh, factors there at the bottom of the slide, you can see there the importance of, uh, of real estate in Canada and in the US more generally, uh, as well as um, a big factor I would say in scoping uh, climate change risk and resiliency type of studies is whether something is majority owned from a particular investor or client versus something that may be co-invested or a joint venture investment. Those conversations can look quite different, for example, if you're working with an owner of a real estate uh, or infrastructure versus someone who is occupying or leasing that asset. So next slide. I did wanna speak a little bit about the real estate context in terms of what can drive interest and action in um, risk and resiliency types of work. Um, perhaps it doesn't go to surprise you that uh, asset value is very important to uh, investor clients from our perspective. Uh, and uh, apologies for the font size on this slide, by the way. Uh, but uh, critically, I would say risk mitigation and uh, really ensuring cost savings and um, cash flow uh, optimization is very important for people who own this asset, these assets around the world. Uh, and you can see there just a couple of um, statistics uh, 
uh, there on the right hand side that JLL has pulled together more globally, but you can see there are some of the cost savings that can be achieved uh, with types of sustainability initiatives being undertaken. Uh, and this can include resiliency assessments or risk assessment for particular assets. Uh, quite important as well is the outcomes of a risk assessment as it relates to favorable financing, incentives, and actually using that information to ensure uh, that on an ongoing basis, operations and capital upgrades are made in an intelligent manner, for example. Next slide. Perfect. Uh, I did want to speak briefly too that um, the real estate industry is changing. Um, it has been quite significant depending on the region and the country in which it's kind of being discussed. But globally, we're seeing trends in various different ways. Uh, and this slide just provides several different ways of, of kind of slicing and dicing that up. Obviously, perhaps no surprise to, uh, to everyone on this, on this webinar today, we're seeing increasing and in extreme events impacts and billion dollar disaster events, for example, in the States. We're also seeing increasing um, interest and sign on into a number of global initiatives as it relates to reporting, sustainability, commitments. Uh, and the two on the right hand side of this slide, um, I like to kind of emphasize, which are the amount of um, specifically venture capital investment heading into green technology and debt issuance as it relates to global sustainability. Uh, we're seeing that rise and I'll speak to how private sector kind of climate tech companies are also increasingly present in the role of the data component of risk assessment for, um, for climate hazards and what that may mean for, um, for moving forward with making sure robust approaches are continued to be taken. Next slide. There is a huge opportunity for action in this space. I hope just by some of those figures and some of the scale of these, um, these portfolios that gets you to think about the, the opportunity here. Just to re-emphasize that uh, 9.6 out of 10 commercial real estate owners and occupiers have set kind of publicly stated goals as it relates to sustainability, many of which are decarbonization targets, but even so they are expressing that commitment publicly to take more of a conscious action towards sustainability. Uh, nine out of 10 have goals that will expire in the next three years. And only two out of 10 have an action plan or have actually dedicated or committed capital to achieving those goals. Uh, and so that's part of the, the mandate and the opportunity really to move from disclosing and understanding risk to actually using that to inform these decisions that are going to be a priority moving forward. Uh, and a big part of what that looks like is embedding risk assessment outputs, particularly that could be completed through the high level screening guide into, for example, decarbonization upgrades of assets or decisions that are happening more strategically across portfolios. Next slide. Uh, and so I did want to speak to kind of how the PIVC high level screening guide can come into this process. Uh, and this can be quite an important conversation, but there are a number of factors that look relatively um, distinct or unique from the real estate perspective that I wanted to emphasize here in red. Um, and you can see there that the, the font in black on this slide um, are kind of core components to uh, what you'd expect from guidance as part of the PIVC screening guide. And the font in red is stuff that it does speak to, but it's a, a bit unique as it relates to the real estate context. Uh, and so very, very kind of upfront as part of the scoping initiative of a, a portfolio application, we have to think about ownership. Uh, and I know this is uh, a big piece of the, uh, of the guide itself, but we have to think about, for example, um, will joint venture or kind of co-invested assets be included as part of an assessment across a portfolio of assets um, and where will the assessment fit in as it relates to due diligence or site acquisition for new assets as it relates to existing uh, portfolio kind of priorities. Uh, I would also um, emphasize that we have to reinforce ambition right up front with a lot of these investor clients. And that's an important component to the work we do is making sure uh, that they aim high and that they understand that it's not only about picking, let's say several assets that may be perceived to be higher risk but understanding holistically there's a need to understand that exposure piece and the likelihood of those impacts first and foremost. Um, from a data perspective, as it relates to what climate projections are used and how likelihood scoring is undertaken, uh, there is a, an added complicating factor there with, um, with folks who may be tempted to divest particular assets from particular contexts. But I would say the bigger factor is the rise of private sector climate technology companies 
Uh, there are probably about 10 of these across North America now that are providing hazard analytics data or climate model data um, that need to be kind of cross compared to projection information from climate modeling. And it's a very important piece of an assessment to make sure that you're using the most appropriate data for the appropriate region that you're hoping to under, undertake an assessment for. Uh, so that's a pretty big um, limitation or caveat to know kind of what data you may be acquiring or using uh, in this space for, uh, for real estate portfolios. Uh, from an assessment and reporting perspective, uh, I think the screening guide is, is well tailored to the needs of real estate portfolios. And there's huge opportunities to, once you're completed the process, actually pilot some of the opportunities for adaptation to specific sites. Uh, you'll often get questions around costing, of course, and you can kind of speak to how that needs to come uh, as a next step. Uh, but that's an important part, of course, of um, those who invest in assets to understand how much it may cost now and what the ROI might be on that moving forward. Uh, and finally, the adaptation components to, um, to the real estate portfolio side of things, there's a number of mechanisms and programs that these outputs could feed into. Uh, there could be data monitoring programs already in place across these portfolios. There are software systems that are used already in terms of monitoring and warnings in some cases. Uh, there's a number of initiatives around decarbonization and assets that are actually being allocated funding for certain upgrades that can be um, embedded into with the uh, results of the assessment process. So I'll leave it at that. Next slide. Uh, I did want to speak to uh, one critical component of the um, high-level screening guide process as it relates to portfolios, which is archetypes. Uh, this just gives you a very simplified visual uh, illustrating what it could look like across a portfolio. Um, and this is just based on some discussions with, uh, with one particular uh, investor in um, North America to date uh, and is not meant to be quantitative. But the idea here is we're trying to help them understand um, what may be most representative for their particular portfolio? Uh, and do they have to assess everything everywhere? Or is there a way to kind of find profiles of assets that may be able to be extended or expanded across the portfolio in similar contexts? And this, I think, is where the high-level screening guide is very, very valuable, is understanding how do you define archetypes, what is appropriate, what's not appropriate, and how do you have to take a multi-hazard approach to understanding those risk profiles across the portfolio? Next slide. Uh, and I spoke to this a little bit at the beginning, but as I said, uh, risk assessment and adaptation uh, really can inform all or very, very many phases of the real estate cycle. So if you look at that figure there on the right, that is a, a typical real estate cycle that we operate within at JLL. And you can see just how diverse that can be from strategizing about portfolio locations to acquiring sites, to planning, capital upgrades, design and engineering, uh, to energy and sustainability related decision making, to leasing, uh, all these types of things can have adaptation actions that can be informed by risk assessment outputs. And I think it's important to recognize and build confidence in the high level screening guide approach to avoid kind of folks thinking they have to do very detailed approaches one at a time to help them understand how it may be transferable across the board. Next slide. Uh, and finally, I'll just leave you with a couple of key takeaways uh, from, the, from this presentation. And I hope this was a, an interesting lens to apply on the high-level screening guide as we kind of further develop what it could look like in this space. Uh, this decade is being seen as the most important time to decarbonize the built environment. And there's a huge role for climate risk to be factored in there to actually kind of take part of this action, uh, especially as upgrades and capital is being dedicated to assets across the world. Uh, we are seeing there's a need to build confidence among portfolio owners to take risk-informed approaches and not necessarily just stop at risk disclosure, which has been the case, I would suggest, in, uh, in the past decade. So to kind of inspire that confidence moving forward with robust frameworks such as the guide. Uh, leveraging and applying this guide, for example, um, specifically as the rapidly market of real estate grows as it relates to sustainability is a great opportunity. And a near and dear issue related to my heart is sharing examples where appropriate and possible from the private sector is a very helpful way of kind of looking at what's worked well, what are the lessons learned. Um, and the last two I'd suggest, and I spoke to this a little earlier, there is a large supply expected of climate related data and technology companies coming out, specifically targeting real estate. And I think it's going to be very important to look at these with a, a grain of salt and to make sure you understand the methodologies 
and interpret this with limitations and the outcomes in mind. Uh, and perhaps doing some cross-referencing with the projections that are already out there publicly and where they may be appropriate for use. And most importantly, we can't do this alone. Um, these are huge organizations involved in investment in real estate, but they cannot be responsible and should not be responsible for assessing risk across these portfolios in isolation. And so it needs to be collaborative, uh, much like the guide speaks to, and the teams that are involved need to be public-private partnerships or working with those who have the expertise to, to do this strategically and in a robust way that expires or that inspires confidence rather. And I think I'll, I'll leave it at that and uh, happy to answer uh, questions later. Fantastic, thank you, Mary. Uh, thank you very much, Glenn.